All right. So you should all be able to see Stellarium by now, I hope. And it looks like a sunny green day. The leaves are not quite out yet. I don't have that many choices as to the landscapes, but this is actually a town in France called Guerin. And this is a beautiful place to be, I bet. And that's what Vermont looks like in the summer. But let's go through tonight's sunset and see what's gonna be in the sky. I tried to turn off as many labels as I can. So let's see what you folks notice. Uh oh, wait, stop. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I was having a little bit of control problem. Let me go back. There. Okay. What's that? Venus. Who wants to speak up? What is that? Venus. Venus. Okay, good. That was either rainy or rose. So good job. Yes. Planet Venus is right now just a little past the farthest that it can be from the sun. So right now you're actually seeing how far Venus can venture away from uh, the sun. And that's because Venus's orbit is closer to the sun than ours. So Venus is always on one side of the sun or the other. It's always e either visible in the evenings, like now, or when it makes its trip around the sun, a few months from now, it'll become visible in the morning. And that's a really cool thing to think about because Venus was not known to be the same object by ancient cultures. As far as I know, the first culture in history to discover that Venus in the morning and Venus in the evening were the same object were the Mayans of Mexico. The ancient Maya tracked Venus's movement very carefully and they knew that that was the same object where, regardless of which side of the sun it was on. So the fact that you have words like evening star and morning star in many other cultures, they hadn't quite made the connection that that thing that was the evening star was the exact same thing that could be the morning star. And when we learn more about Galileo, you'll also discover that Venus was sort of like uh, the key that unlocked the nature of the universe. So Venus is something to think about. It, Venus is constantly teaching us things. Uh, and if you imagine, oh, what's that up there? That's not Venus. Now in Stellarium, it looks very small. So this one, I'll give you a freebie because this one changes every night. And it goes around the earth once a moon. The moon? Yeah, that one should have been easy. And this is what the moon is gonna look like tonight. Did you see it last night? It was a little bit less than half. Now it's gonna be a little more than half. It was just before the quarter moon last night. And tonight it's gonna be a little bit of a waxing gibbous. And this is an interesting thing to think about because the sun just set. Do you notice where the moon is right now in the sky relative to the sun? Let's just say that I just set it up right after sunset. So let's assume that the sun is level on the horizon. Where is the moon relative to the horizon? Hmm. In the east. Well, it's actually kind of in the center of the sky. Do you see what I mean here? Uh-huh. Now where, let's see how, 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 who could predict this. Where will the moon be at sunset when it's a full moon? A little bit of a challenging question there. If the moon halfway across the sky at sunset, and it looks like half a moon, which way is the moon moving? Like, let's think about that. Maybe I should jump a day into the future. Watch the moon. This is April Fool's Day, but I'm not trying to fool you guys. I think this is the first April Fool's Day that's been officially canceled. <laughs> the world has already fooled us enough. We don't need any more tricks. But nobody's saying anything. I'm a little concerned. I hear a lot of noise. Somebody's eating something. <laughs> the noise just ended. <laughs> so who's, is that somebody's brain thinking really hard? It sounds like chewing. Well, come on, nobody's answering my question. But if this is April 1st, Okay, let's jump exactly one day into the future. Where do you think the moon's going to be relative to where it is now, or relative to Venus? You could say east or west. You could say left or right. Closer to Venus. You think tomorrow night it's going to be closer to Venus? Let's find out. Ready? Tomorrow. Boom. Uh-oh. Sorry, bud. 
I think your your guess was not exactly right. Let's go to uh, Friday night, the third. Uh oh. And what's going to be happening to the moon's fate as we go from night to night? On April 3rd, it's going to be even more filled in. And let's go to April 4th. Uh oh. April 5th. April 6th. Uh oh. What happened? Oops. I hit the wrong button. Sorry, guys. Here, April 6th. There. What does the moon look like now? Full. A full moon. And that is six days from now. And where is it in the sky relative to the sun? East. It's on the opposite side from the sun. So if you you want to get a fairly basic idea of the full moon, look, if you, uh, maybe I'll stop the share for a second. If you look up at me here, when the, the sun is here, if the moon is in the same direction of, as the sun, it's going to be a new moon. And every night the moon will be a little farther away from where the sun was. And when you have a full moon, you have the sun and the moon on exactly opposite sides of the sky. So when the sun sets in the west during a full moon, the full moon will be rising in the east at the same time because they're about exactly 180 degrees apart. That's what creates the lighting effect and that's what creates the face of the moon. So the moon is here now. So when the sun sets, it's already halfway across the sky. Tomorrow night, it'll be here. The next night, it'll be here. And then the next night, it'll be here. So you kind of get the idea. The moon is changing the distance between it and the sun. And that cycle takes 29 and a half days. That's where our ancestors got the idea for. It's so quiet. Digital crickets. Was that 28.5 or 29.5? Now, it's a, it's a complicated thing. It's, if I say the new moon and the, the sun, and I wait till the next new moon, that's 29 and a half days for that to repeat itself. But if I were just tracking the moon going around the Earth, then I would say that the moon only takes 27 days to go around the Earth. So this is one of the things that confuses even teachers because they see both numbers. The full moon cycle repeats every 29 and a half days, but it takes 27 days for the moon to go around the earth. So where, where is this two and a half days going? Does it get lost in the dryer with my sock? So if you, we're thinking about this, and I don't want to tease you guys because I want to get on the constellations, but the moon, to get back to a new moon or to get back to a full moon, has to be lined up with the sun just right. And if the Earth were sitting still, then there would be a full moon every 27 days. But is the Earth sitting still? No. Well, every day we move where we are around the sun. So the earth has moved a little bit so that means that the moon has to move a couple of extra days to get back to that spot where the light will be just right to be called either a new moon or a full moon so this is one of the funny things about astronomy it's a, a very simple thing in a sense but it's very complicated to understand because you have to think about all the moving parts you have to think about the fact that the earth is moving around the sun and the moon is moving around us and putting those two things together helps you understand the difference between this 27 day cycle of the moon going around the earth and the 29 and a half day cycle of the full moon repeating itself. So the full moon in itself is not a best way to count the orbit of the moon, but because humans are stuck on the ground, we're not sitting in space looking at the moon going around the earth, making an objective observation. Our observation of the moon is very subjective because we are on a moving platform. We're not an objective observer of the moon. So this is one of those concepts that you have to kind of get when you want to understand, you know, how we got from ancient astronomy, which is just saying, woo, what's that? To modern astronomy, where we have tools and observations that can give us answers and give us fixed numbers that are very precise. I mean, I have a book in my office that can predict solar eclipses for the next 1,000 years. How cool is that? That's precision. That's clockwork. 
that means that we know what the moon is doing and it's not likely to surprise us as far as its orbit is concerned. And that's the same that can be said with the planets too. But I'm going to move back to Stellarium so I can share my screen again with you guys because I want to talk about some constellations. So let's go back to Stellarium and I've got it uh, in as label free of a mode as I can. You, uh, you folks can see it. Hold on, I'm making sure I have a feeling I was on the wrong screen. Is everybody able to see it? Leela, Stellarium? Okay. Now, by the way, I've got to mention that Stellarium has these cool things added in. These are meteor showers. The Pi Virginids and the Theta Virginids. Anybody want to guess as to who they're named after? Virginids? The state of Virginia? No? Anybody? I feel like that teacher in Ferris Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> All right. So the point is, I think we talked about this last time, like the Perseid meteor showers come from Perseus. The Virginid meteor shower comes from the constellation. Somebody save me. Speak up. Virgo. Oh, yes, Virgo, please. <laughs> I hope you guys remember this is an interactive class. You, I feel like a comedian dying on stage. Oh. So now, Virgo is not obviously visible, but actually, remember, I messed around with the date and time. So let me put it back to tonight. There. Do you notice how it's darker? Hmm. This is the time of year when we notice the daylight changing dramatically. Every day is several minutes longer than the day before. Have you kids noticed that? Have you noticed how the days are getting longer? And now, not just because of daylight savings time, but the actual lengthening of the day. The day is actually a lot longer than the night at this time, and it's going to continue until the summer solstice. Okay. Is anybody there? So, all right. Look at the moon up here. Look at Venus here. And then, does anybody recognize this third brightest object in the sky? Something that is the brightest star at night? Please, we talked about this guy. I'm going to summon the Order of the Phoenix, if nobody tells me the name of this. Mars. What's that? Sirius. Sirius, yes. I just want you to notice that Sirius is very bright. And remember, we talked about the winter circle. Can you see it? There's Pollux and Castor, there's Procyon, and there's Rigel, there's uh, Zebaron, and there's Capella. So one of the things about twilight is that you can see only the brightest stars, and that actually can make it easier. It might get a little complicated when it gets totally dark and you might have too many stars. So use this fade of twilight to help you learn the constellations. And then you're going to see what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. But I want to move on to new stuff. But here's a little bit of a challenge. Oh, yeah, I guess you could call it a quiz. Oh, you see a satellite go by? All right, I've got time now stopped again. And according to Stellarium, this is what it'll look like at around 8.17 tonight. Can you still see Venus? What is Venus going to be right next to? Somebody speak up. B. Mars? No. No, that's Venus, the planet, but this doesn't look like a planet. The... Eh. From the Subaru. Yeah, there you go. The Subaru. The Seven Sisters. The Pleiades. And actually... I didn't talk about this last time, but the individual stars of the Pleiades are named after nymphs. And perhaps most famous is Electra, one of these Maya. So you can see there's Electra. And one of them over here is not a nymph, but the famous Titan Atlas. Now, when people draw Atlas, they always hold, show him holding up the earth. But that's a misconception. If you actually read the Greek myths, Atlas was not holding up the earth. Do you know what he was holding up? The sky. The sky. 
It's like our planetarium. Imagine if this planetarium dome actually required me to hold it up while I was teaching a class. Then I would be like Atlas, separating the sky from the earth. But in ancient times, the Greeks believed that the sky was a sphere that surrounded the earth. You may have heard of the concept of the celestial sphere. So for them, the idea that the sky was a sphere, like a globe, was very natural. They thought it was the globe that surrounded the globe that we call the earth. Earth in the middle, sky around it like an eggshell. And that's the idea that the ancient Greeks had. So when you see pictures of Atlas holding up a ball, he's not holding up the planet Earth, at least not by the ancient Greek standards. He's holding up the celestial sphere. And there's a whole funny story about how Hercules, you know, tricked him in, uh, into doing that. But that's another story for another time. But the seven sisters, Subaru. Um, so that's where the Venus is going to be right next to. And does anybody remember that Subaru is part of a larger constellation over here? <laughs> I'm circling it. Do I have to make sounds? On the farm, the cow goes. The bull? Who is the bull? Yes, Taurus the bull. Thank you. So remember, one horn, two horns, big nose, red tongue, right forehead. This is just a review. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to make sure that you guys are building your knowledge. If we move on too quickly to other constellations, then you might forget what we already covered. And who wants to tell me which constellation the moon is in tonight? The moon is right next to somebody's belly button. The Big Dipper. No, that's in the north, my friend. And just to, just to show you that the Big Dipper is visible. Ursa Major. That is Ursa Major and the Big Dipper are the same thing. So that was correct in that guess, but no, you're not thinking about, uh, let me give you another hint. Here above the moon are two stars that are almost identical in brightness. One could say that those stars look like twins. Gemini, the Gemini twins. Ah, yes, the Gemini twins. Excellent. Pollux and Castor, their heads are right above the moon. So this is something that might happen if the skies are clear tonight. You might go out and you might see the moon and the moon might be so bright that you might not see all of the Gemini constellation, but you might see their bright heads above the moon. So part of doing astronomy in a place like Vermont is that you gotta be ready for less than ideal conditions. We don't live in a desert where the skies are always clear at night. We have clouds, we have haze, we have fog. And when the moon is involved, the moon can make things hard to see. So it's good to know where the stars are, even if you can't see the whole constellation. Just by knowing the brightest stars, you know that the moon is in Gemini, and that is already something connected to what we talked about before. Because the moon and Venus are both following that line that we call the ecliptic. And I'm gonna bring it back up just to remind you, the ecliptic, and there's a lot of different versions of it on here. You can see the checklist. See it? The moon can be a few degrees above or below this line. And so can the planets, but they always follow it very carefully. And you can see that Gemini is right on that line. So Gemini is a very important constellation to learn for that reason. And that's going to be a theme for today, too, because I want to talk about some other members of the Zodiac line constellations. So, if anybody has a question, please, please let me know. I would love to answer them. And if you have many ways to let us know about your questions, if you want to send it through chat or just speak up, up loud, that's fine too. So, I'm going to move on. I don't hear any questions. So, see questions for, about what? Well, any of this stuff. I mentioned Taurus, and I mentioned Gemini. Those are two members of the Zodiac. Do you guys remember the one that is next to Gemini that was so poor that it barely is visible as a constellation? It looks like four dots. 
and it tastes good with remoulade. So, remember this from the zodiac constellations. Cancer and Gemini, they're right next to each other. Gemini actually looks like a pair of twin brothers, actually looks like a picture. Cancer, you have to have a really powerful imagination to see that picture in that sky. Do you see it, anybody? The funniest thing about Cancer is that there is a object in the middle of this constellation that's actually brighter than any of its stars. It's called the Beehive Cluster. It's this little bunch of stars right here. Do you remember the Pleiades that we just talked about? This is another kind of cluster. It just doesn't get nearly as much attention as the Subaru Cluster, the Pleiades, but this is called the Beehive. And I think Cancer is the only constellation that has a cluster being the brightest part of the constellation, not a single star, but an amalgamation of stars. And if I put up that illustration of the crab, you can see that the beehive cluster is right where the center of his body would be. But notice how dim the stars are that make up Cancer the crab. So you might not even see Cancer at all because of the moon being out tonight. Poor thing, Mr. Krabs. They left him the worst of the stars in the zodiac. Now, does anybody see something right here? Cancer is not a constellation that you need to spend a lot of time looking for. The beehive cluster is definitely cool to look for, and you should definitely use a telescope on it if you have a chance. But I wouldn't worry too much if you have a hard time seeing Cancer the Crab. It's not a lot of good stars to work with. But right here, I have something that is great to work with, something that we can credit the ancient Egyptians for giving us. Is that enough of a hint? Does anybody see it? Perhaps this is an image of humankind's oldest enemy. A creature. Snake. Snake. Huh? snake. A snake? Okay. I'm thinking about when our ancestors lived out on the plains of East Africa. We probably made uh, stone tools millions of years ago and we hung out by the campfire for safety but there was something that scared us. Every night we would hear it bellowing in the dark. Leo the lion. Ah, I gave you the enough, enough clues. You're looking at the constellation of Leo the lion. But one of the things I like about Leo is that it looks like the stars of Leo are giving us a blueprint for the world's oldest known statue, the Sphinx. But I know some kids say that this looks like a mouse with a tail. But that's if you're looking at it backwards. Just imagine that this is the eye of the lion and this is his mane and his brightest star is his heart. A star called Regulus. Does that ring a bell for any of you guys? Sirius' brother. That's right. Is that B, Sirius' brother? Regulus Black, the first of the blacks to try to confront Voldemort. And Regulus is the heart of the lion. You get the connection, lion-hearted, brave. Um, so Regulus is an interesting star name, too. In ancient times, the Romans used to call that star Rex, not Regulus. Does anybody know what Rex means in Latin? King. Yes, it means the king with the crown on his head, like Tyrannosaurus Rex which means, you know, king of the tyrant lizards. Well, there's a problem with having a star called king. Later on in the time of the Roman Empire, there was a new religion that became very popular. We call it Christianity. And in that religion, they did not believe that there could be a king in the sky other than the god that they considered to be the king of the universe. So you can't have two kings in the sky. And they thought that calling a star Rex was sort of like going against their own religious doctrine. So I don't know who the astronomer was that proposed it, but someone said, let's stop calling that star Rex, the king, and let's call it Regulus. Regulus means like viceroy. It means like not the top dog, but like second in command, kind of like vice president. 
So, sorry to any vice presidents out there. But Regulus means little king, viceroy. And it's uh, sort of a demotion. So isn't that interesting? There was a star called Rex, the king of the sky, and now it's been demoted to a viceroy. But that is the heart of the lion, Leo, and Regulus is a star that is very important for another reason. Not only is it an, in a constellation that's a member of the Zodiac, but that star, Regulus, is extremely close to being right on the Zodiac line. So if I put up that ecliptic line again, can you see what I mean? That line goes right through the Gemini twins. It goes right through Taurus, his horns. But Regulus is a very bright star, in, and it's almost exactly on the line. So I like for you to know Regulus because it tells you where the Zodiac is. And I, I didn't get into this very much last week, but if you look at Stellarium and you see the absolute magnitude, Regulus is one of those stars that's so bright that it's in a negative magnitude. Remember, the higher the number, the dimmer the star. A zero magnitude star would be very bright, and Le uh, Leo's Regulus is even brighter, so it's negative half magnitude. I know this is confusing, but if you decide to become an astronomer, you're going to eventually have to learn absolute magnitude and relative magnitude and luminosity. So these are, these are things that eventually you would be familiar with, but I don't want to bog you down with those details now. Leo the lion. Let me take those lines out of the way, and let me show you how I see it. Let me get that ecliptic line out of the way, too. So... Do you see the lion without any assistance? Can you see it? Yeah. Here's yeah. the nose. Here's the eye. Here's the mane. Altogether, the head looks like a hook or like a sickle shape. And once you learn the head of Leo the lion, you will always be able to find him easily. Then you'll see Regulus down here below the hook shape of the head. And here, I would like to imagine that these are his front legs extending out near Regulus. And you can imagine that this is his belly, and there's his rear end. Smells like zebra. And here's his back. But this little trapezoid shape right here is his body. And here's his bright tail. And then, if you can see his tail, the second brightest star of, of Leo is called Denebola. And remember that name because that is a, a word from Arabic that refers to tails. I know that there's another star in Cygnus the Swan called Deneb, which means the tail. So Denebola, I don't know exactly what that modification means, but it's a word that in Arabic means tail. And I know that in Hebrew, the word tail is Zanaf. Zanaf, Deneb. Both Hebrew and Arabic come from a similar root language. So just so you know, that there were lots of Hebrew scholars that studied the sky, too, in ancient Jerusalem, and they contributed to astronomy, too, like other cultures of the Mediterranean. So, Denebola, Regulus, Leo the Lion, and again, I'll put the cartoon up there. This is one of the cartoons that Stellarium has included that I actually completely agree with. I don't, I don't like some of the illustrations, I don't think all of them match the stars the way my imagination works, but Leo, to me, is almost perfectly spot on. So once you get a chance to go outside, Leo is a sign of spring. The fact that Leo is out in the evening is a, is a fact that spring is here. Uh, you wouldn't have seen Leo in the evening during the middle of winter unless you stayed up very late, but as the sky is changing and we're seeing new constellations, you could think of Leo as being you know, a welcome sign. But that brings me to one of my favorite constellations of all time. The one that will explain why we have the theta and the pi virginids uh, happening in this part of the sky. But let me put up the name first. Well, you've heard of Virgo. She's not completely visible right now. So for this constellation to be visible, we have to stay up a little bit later. Hold on. Sorry, I don't want to jump ahead. But notice this clock here is telling us that it is 8.33. So watch as I advance time, and you'll notice that the place where Virgo is will be rising and become more visible as the night goes on.
Okay. I wish I could get those meteors out of the way. They're distracting us from the picture. But I haven't figured out how to turn those off. If anybody else learns how to turn these little things off, I would be gratefully grateful to you because uh, I've been able to get everything else but the meteor showers out of the way. But does anybody, before I begin talking about Virgo, does anybody in our group know anything about this constellation? Please don't tell me your horoscope. I don't want to get into all that. Nobody. You've never heard. Would I? Would you be surprised to know that there's a strong connection between the constellation Virgo and a Broadway musical written by a Vermonter that has been lighting up Broadway for more than a year now and won several Tony Awards. Written by Katie. Ooh. Sorry. Who said that? I did. All right. Well. Somebody follows Broadway. Yep. Who am I talking about? Who's in that musical that's in the sky right now? Virgo doesn't really tell you much about her. Let's go down the, let's go through the basics. Does anybody know what Virgo actually means? No? You're all so innocent or you're all very embarrassed? I hear a lot of chuckling. I'm imagining seeing blushing faces behind the, the Zoom uh, screens, but... Oh, we have a question coming in. Oh, the Virgin. I was oh, trying okay. to help. Uh, yeah, thanks, <laughs> Tina. It doesn't count when you give me the answers. I was cheating. I was trying to help him. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, Virgo just means the Virgin. But that doesn't tell you anything about who she is. And uh, you kids probably were too young to participate in what we did at the museum over a year ago. Ah, actually, you weren't that, wasn't that long ago, when we set the Guinness Book of World Records record for the world's largest astronomy lesson. Uh, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I was the teacher for that lesson. And I spent a lot of time talking about Virgo because this constellation has been worshiped as a goddess on three different continents in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe. So calling her Virgo the Virgin does not at all give you a hint as to how powerful and important of a lady she has been in different cultures. For example, in ancient Egypt, they associated these stars with the goddess known as Isis. And of course, because of a group of terrorists, that word has a different meaning to a lot of people. But if you know your ancient uh, Egyptian mythology, Isis was the wife of Osiris and the mother of Horus. And her story uh, is an interesting one in Egyptian mythology, but she was the powerful goddess of fertility. According to the Egyptians, she was the person who taught them how to grow food. She taught them how to plant grains in the fertile flood flooded you know, uh, plains of the Nile River Valley. So for the ancient Egyptians, Isis was kind of like mother nature. She was the goddess of uh, using nature for feeding humans. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like any kind of story you've heard before from other cultures? Well, if you were to leave Egypt 5,000 years ago and travel northeast out of Egypt into Mesopotamia, which is the part of Asia that is now where Iraq is, that was the place where the Sumerians and the Babylonians uh, and the Assyrian civilizations rose. And in those lands, they worshiped a goddess that they called Easter. Hmm. Does that ring any bells to anyone? What Easter. time of year? Easter was her name. And guess what time of year she appears in the sky? Spring time. Ah, springtime. It just turns out that I happen to have been in Berlin about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, and I went to a museum called the Pergamon Museum, and there I got to see the Ishtar Gate. Emperor Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian emperor who's actually mentioned in the Bible as the one who abducted the Jewish people from their homeland, the Babylonian captivity. 
he wasn't a very nice guy in history, but to his own people in Babylon, he created this beautiful marketplace to sort of a, a monument to his own uh, might as a king and an emperor. And that marketplace was completely lost uh, to history and time until a group of German archaeologists dug it back up and they reconstructed the entire Easter Gate inside of this museum in Berlin. And I got to walk through it, which was pretty cool because it's not like looking at one artifact. It's like walking through an entire uh, section of a town. It's like walking through the mall as it would have been 4,000 years ago. And uh, it was pretty cool, but it was amazing to see all the things associated with Easter because you know, Easter was worshiped as a goddess by those folks, but she had an animal that was a pet, a sort of a, an animal associated with her that was always by her side. And the Easter gate was decorated with this animal. Can you guess what animal is by her side? A rabbit. <laughs> oh, nice guess. But I was talking about the lion, Leo. I'm going to actually see if I can find some of those pictures that I took last year. I wasn't thinking about this uh, until now. But Leo the lion is right next to Virgo. And I know this version of Virgo kind of looks like Taylor Swift, but that's not really the way I see her in the stars. But do you notice what she's holding in her hand, by the way? That part is part of all the stories. What's she holding? in her left hand. Fishing rod? <laughs> I think that's actually supposed to be like a, a plant. But do you see what's here? What's a plant? Yeah, different kind of plant. But this looks like a bundle of flowers, right? OK, I'll have to I'll try to go explain that. But let's, let me just wrap it up with talking about these ancient ideas. So Egyptians thought that she was Isis, one of their most important goddesses. To the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Sumerians, she was Ishtar, one of their most powerful goddesses. And if you go up around the Mediterranean into Europe, in ancient times, the Greeks, they saw her as who Sadie correctly guessed, or uh, you, you get three guesses, so one of them was right. Not Demeter, that's the goddess of agriculture, not Aphrodite, that's the goddess of love, but Persephone, who is the goddess of flowers. And right here is the brightest star that's in the constellation of Virgo. It's a star called Spica. Spica is, is a word that literally means spike, just like how a lot of flowers are arranged on a tall spike. Think of wheat, think of grass flowers how they grow in a single column on a row along a stem. So they look like a spike. They look like a spear. And that word spike is a reference to flowers as much as it is to pointy objects that you don't want to sit on. So spica is one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's a bluish colored star. And it's way brighter than all of the rest of the stars that are in Virgo. So if you cannot find Virgo, you can at least find Spica, and then I'm going to show you how you can make a picture with these stars. I hope you can follow along because I have to say, Virgo is not as easy to see as Leo the lion, partly because she's humongous. This is one of the biggest constellations. Her feet are right here, and her head is up here. So she takes up way more space than almost any member of the Zodiac that I can think of. I think she is the longest. I haven't measured but she is big. And right here are her eyes. And right here are her feet. And I know that's going to be a challenge. So let me start with the easiest part. There's Spica. And I know I wish I could get rid of those Theta Virginids. But it, do you see that right? Or, oh, that was pretty cool. That was one of those meteors. Do you see these two stars? They are right above where Spica is, and I see them as the waist of Virgo. Think of where her belt would be. And then if you go up here, you can see the two stars that I like to see as her shoulders. So once you've seen those four stars, 
you are on your way to finding the constellation of the goddess here. So this little rectangle, shoulders, waist, it kind of makes a trapezoid with the theta version. It's right where her belly button could be. And then if you add to that, you can imagine that these two shoulders have arms sticking out of them. This is her right arm, her hand, her elbow, and her shoulder. And then here is her left arm. Oh, by the way, that star Porima is named after a midwife from ancient mythology. But that is her armpit on her left arm. Here's her elbow and her hand. So if you're following along with me, you see three stars that make one arm and three stars that make another arm here. And then if you can see the two arms, that's when you're ready to see the face of this goddess. And in my imagination, she's got two twinkling eyes right here, a little button nose and a pointy chin. Do you see that long triangular face right there? Doesn't it look kind of cool? It looks like she's in distress. I think of it as a person that looks like they're doing this, like, uh, you know, Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone. <laughs> Doesn't she look like that? Like the screams, you know, from the, the famous painting? Oh! Well, you'd be making that expression too if you knew all the stuff that poor Persephone had been through in the ancient Greek story. And if you can see that little triangular head right there, then you can even imagine her hair sticking up from her head, just like uh, when Karen Nyberg was running through the space station. It looks like her hair is sticking up. She looks like she's in distress. Well, now let me finish the picture. If you can see her head, if you can see her shoulders, if you can see her arms, and then you, you can see down here, this is her torso. Do you notice that spica is not a part of her body? Spica is off to the side. It's separate from her body. And I always imagine the spica is a flower, maybe the last flower she was holding before something terrible happened to her. Maybe I should put my cloak back on. If I'm gonna tell this story the right way, maybe I should do it wearing something like this. Does anybody know what happened to Persephone? <laughs> she got kidnapped by Hades. Ah. But wait, I haven't shown you her feet. Look at her dainty feet. See them right here? There is her left foot, there's her right foot. And if you draw a line through the feet, they point you right towards the stars that make her legs and her waist. So there's one leg, there's another leg. And do you see, if you can see this all together, it looks like a person falling. It doesn't look like she's moving in a willing way. It looks like she's being dropped from somewhere in the sky. She's falling. That's the way I see it. And that makes perfect sense because yes, who was it that said she got kidnapped by Hades? I, I, I couldn't tell who said it, but you were absolutely right. So this is the poor goddess that was kidnapped by the Lord of the dead, yeah. Hades. Okay, enough of that. So, does anybody want to tell us a story besides the fact that this poor young woman was kidnapped by an evil god of death? Anybody want to fill us in? She was kidnapped, and then while she was in the underworld, she ate a seed of some sort of pomegranate seed, maybe, and uh, which meant that she could only be away for half a year. Well... Yeah, I mean, that is the quickest way to answer the story, but, you know, to give you some kind of background, Persephone was the goddess of flowers, so she was immortal. She did not belong in the land of the dead. She should never go there. And her mother, Demeter, never bothered to tell her anything about the ways of the land of the dead because she never expected her daughter to wind up down there. She's an immortal goddess, after all. But Hades wanted to marry Persephone. He saw her jealously from the underworld, and he thought, that beautiful goddess, she should be by my side. But he knew that she, she would never willingly go into the underworld. Because why would the goddess of flowers choose to live in the land of the dead where there's no sunshine? Never is going to happen. So he realized he was going to have to abduct her. 
And so he came up with a terrible plot and he kidnapped Persephone right from the middle of the earth during the middle of the day. He got away with the crime at first. Nobody saw what happened. And then Persephone was left alone in the underworld, lost. She did not know where she was. She did not know how to get back home. And she was terrified. She was surrounded by dead people. And uh, she freaked out. She didn't know what to do. And she was getting hungrier and hungrier as time went by. And to her surprise, she saw growing in the underworld the most unlikely thing, a pomegranate tree, a tree filled with fruit. And it must have seemed strange to her because her mom was in charge of making things like pomegranates grow. And she didn't think her mom did anything in the underworld. Hmm, that's weird. So strange, a fruit tree growing underground. So as Persephone stayed there underground in the underworld, not knowing what the rules were, she got hungrier and hungrier, and she got tempted to taking one of those pomegranates and eating it. Just off the top of your head, does that sound like any other stories you guys have heard before? <laughs> yes. Forbidden fruits? Mm -hmm. Well, so she took the pomegranate in her hand, and she went to take a bite. And have you ever eaten pomegranates, any of you? Yes. What's the best thing of, well, what is it like to eat a pomegranate? It's it takes awesome. a long time. <laughs> it is kind of a workout, right? A pomegranate is pretty much all seeds with the pulp around them being the thing that you like to eat and the juice. So when you eat a pomegranate, you're basically getting a mouthful of seeds and you're gonna soak the pulp off of them. And that kind of makes sense because one of the versions of the story that I remember the most is that she just took one bite and in that bite were six seeds. And as soon as she took a bite, it was too late for her. That fruit was not a normal fruit. It was not the fruit of the sun and Demeter's work in the soil and the air above. This was a cursed fruit, the food of the dead. And anyone who took a bite would be cursed to stay in the underworld forever. Obviously, if you were already dead, you didn't care. But Persephone wasn't already dead. She was an immortal goddess. She should have been able to live forever. And now she was instead stuck in Hades town. <laughs> like the musical. Anyway, so she gets stuck down there. But then Demeter sends the messenger god Hermes to rescue her. And Hermes gets down to the underworld. He was the only Olympian god besides Hades that was allowed to go in and out of the underworld at will because he was a psychopomp. He was a messenger that would bring dead people to the underworld. So he had privileges. He had a, a, a backstage pass at Hades town. So Hermes goes in and looks for Persephone and says, oh, hey, here you are. Your mom, Demeter, would like to see you again. I'm going to take you home. But then he finds out that she's eaten the cursed fruit and he confronts Hades and says, Hades, do you realize what's gonna happen if you have the goddess of flowers in the land of the dead forever? It's a good thing to think about at this time of the spring. What would happen if the goddess of flowers was trapped in the land of the dead forever? I mean, don't just think mythologically, think biologically. What would happen if flowers didn't bloom? Okay. Maybe. No. no pollen. No nectar, no fruit, no seeds, no wheat, no pomegranates, no apples, no corn. No, no life. No beans, no food. Sad spring. Yes, silent spring. But yes, the point is that story is, I love the story because it sort of shows the interdependence of nature. It shows how if you mess up one thing in nature, you can cause all kinds of negative uh, consequences for other things. Yeah. Just like how, you know, we learned if we destroy one species, we might lose others. Uh, in this story, Hades learned the hard way that he can't just mess with nature. He can't just take flowers out of the picture and expect everything to be okay. Because Hermes made a threat to Hades. He said, you know what, Hades? You know what's going to happen if you don't let this goddess of flowers return to her home? No flowers. No food. And what's going to happen next? Hades town is going to be overrun. So basically, Hades almost destroyed himself. By kidnapping the goddess of flowers, he could have killed the entire world 
and the entire world population would have died of hunger and they would have all come streaming down to the river Styx to cross the water and into Hades town and he would not have had any power to stop them. There would have been so many people that he would have lost command of the underworld and his throne and crown and all his treasures would be lost. You guys, you guys know Hades isn't just the god of the underworld. He's also the god of treasure and gems and minerals and all the things that are found underground. Do you know what the Romans called Hades? Anyone? Nobody knows the Roman name for the god of the dead? The god of the dead in Roman name has something orbiting around it called Styx, like the river Styx. There's also a body called Kerberos, like the three-headed dog. Oh, Matthew, you're close. Mars is the god of war. Pluto. Pluto is the god of the dead. So just to connect, Hades equals Pluto. Hades to the Greeks, Pluto to the Romans. And have you kids ever heard of the concept of uh, plutocracy? Does anybody know what that word means? Does Plutocracy does not mean that we're ruled by people from the planet Pluto. Plutocrat? Does that word sound familiar? You may hear it talked about in politics and in modern affairs. Okay, just to fill you guys in, because you're going to learn this in history eventually. The word plutocrat means somebody who rules based on the fact that they have money. Somebody who buys their way into power. And a plutocracy is a government in which the rich get to call the shots because they're Pluto. They have the wealth, they have the gold, they have the gems, they have the minerals, and they get to tell everybody else what to do. So you could say that our country is supposed to be a democracy, which means rule by the people in Greek, but sometimes some countries can become plutocracies, which is not ruled by the people, but ruled by Pluto, well, <laughs> ruled by people like Pluto, the wealthy. And so, yeah, a world ruled by money is a plutocracy. So it's an interesting thing to think about because it's all connected to this story and Pluto and Hades in the underworld. So that's what I like about Hades Town. If you guys haven't familiar with the new musical that Anais Mitchell wrote, Hades Town is about a man who owns a mine. Ah. It's so perfect. That's why I love Anais Mitchell's writing because she really loves the Greek mythology, but she takes it out of context so it becomes a totally different story. Anyway, I know this is getting a long story, but so we've got Persephone in the underworld. Hades thinks he's so clever. He kidnaps the goddess of flowers and then realizes that he's about to doom his own kingdom. But he knows that the curse is the curse. You can't break the rules if you eat the food of the dead. You've got to stay in the land of the dead forever. So Hades has to come up with a compromise. And then, in the version that I remember reading, Hades notices that Persephone only ate a small mouthful of seeds, about six of them, before she realized the curse. So he said to Hades said to Hermes, all right, I'll make a deal. This goddess only ate six little seeds, so I'm going to keep her for six full moons of the year. One full moon for every one of those seeds. And after that time has passed, I will let her return to you and Demeter so she can run around in your happy little sunny green land you guys like so much. So I know you may have heard this story before, but do you see the connection? Let's think about what's happening astronomically speaking. We're in April, it's April 1st. And tonight you had to wait until uh, maybe 10, almost 11 o'clock to see her. But if you stayed out tonight, you would see Virgo rising in the east. And that would tell you something. If you were an ancient person like the ancient Greeks, you would say, ooh, Persephone is leaving the underworld. Her sentence is done. She's escaping Hades' grasp. And now she's returning to our world. And guess what happens at the time when you see Virgo at night? It's spring. Spica, the blue flower star, brings the flowers. 
As spica rises with Virgo, so do the real ro flowers rise out of the ground. But if you guys know that she's on the Zodiac line, she's one of the members of the Zodiac, like Leo and like Cancer and like Gemini. That means that there's a time when we will not see her anymore. If we're seeing her rise in the east now in the spring, anybody want to take a guess as to when she goes out of sight? In the fall. In the fall. Oh, right. So the coolest thing about the constellation of Virgo is that it perfectly lines up with the seasons when we see flowers and when we see green grass and leaves on the trees and when we plant food in our garden, flowers blooming, tomatoes ripening, blackberries sweetening, all these wonderful things happen when Virgo is in the sky at night. And when she starts to vanish from our sight, I'm gonna put up the zodiac line so you guys can see that. Oops, what is going on? Our colors, oh sorry, I hit the wrong button. All of a sudden it wanted me to choose a color. But look at, look at where these constellations are. There's Spica, again, I'm gonna zoom in on the area where Virgo is. She's right on that line. And it turns out that the sun starts to cover up the area where her head is in September, which is when fall begins. And so one of my favorite things about the fall is that when you go out and look at the sunset after the, the sun sets, all you see is Persephone's feet sticking out of the ground. Her head is covered up. So it looks like her feet are sticking out like she's getting swallowed up by the earth, like, ah, help me. And that's what her constellation looks like at night in the autumn. So if you were an ancient Greek person and you saw Virgo slipping off into the West, you would say, oh no, Persephone is going back to Hades town. She's going back into the underworld. And what's coming next? Well, fall. Now, the one thing I want to ask, I want to see if anybody here wants to get creative and think uh, outside of the box. The people who made up this story are the ancient Greeks. And if you've ever seen Greece, they don't have the same seasons that we do. I've never seen pictures of, you know, Santorini covered in a two feet of snow. I don't know about you guys. But that climate there is a lot warmer than ours is here. So can you think of anything else that might be happening in that part of the world that would correspond with our seasons too? Just take a guess. I grew up in Florida, so this is easy for me. Because Florida does not have strong winters. In fact, summer and winter are hardly any different from each other, except for one. The days get shorter. That happens, but if you live that close to the equator, in Greece, yes, the days get shorter in the winter, almost the same as us. In fact, this is another total separate sub subject, but if you look at a latitude line, the latitude line that runs through the Canadian border, the 45th parallel, actually runs through the Mediterranean on the southern coast of France. So that's actually pretty close to the ancient Greek uh, world. So their seasonal daylight change is actually similar to ours. Winter days are very short, summer days are very long, but they don't have the snow and the cold and the ice that we do. Can you think of something else that might have a similar effect on the flowers and the plants, making it look like they all have gone away, but it's not because they're buried under the snow. Just guessing, because if you hear about people talking about a Mediterranean climate, Los Angeles has a Mediterranean climate. Rain. Ah, who's that? Who said that? Sadie. All right, you got it. You see, if you live in a place that is like the Mediterranean or on the coast of California, when they call it a Mediterranean climate, it's because it's very dry and it doesn't rain that often. And when it's winter for us here, it's the dry season for the Greek peninsula. So if you lived in ancient Greece, you wouldn't have seen snowfall, but you would have seen things turn brown. You would have seen the green grass dry up. You would have seen flowers stop blooming for the winter months. And then when the, the spring rains returned, you would get rain. When Virgo rises at night, it would start raining again. And the dry weather would give way to green grass and flowers blooming. And then farmers could plant their crops. 
So even though the Greeks don't have the winters that we do, they have a seasonal cycle that still matches with the story of Virgo, where they don't see much in the winter and they see a lot of green in the summer. So it's, a, it's just something to think about because when I heard that story at first, I was like, wait a minute, they don't have winter in ancient Greece. And just another little historical uh, footnote to help you understand this. The people that we call the ancient Greeks, they weren't actually from where Greece is now. They migrated there from a place north of Greece. And the people who were originally in what is now Greece were chased out. They were a culture that was called the Pelasgians. And to the ancient Greeks, they were, you know, a sort of an enemy people that they pushed out and eventually took over their land. So a lot of the stories that the ancient Greeks knew came from a culture that was actually born northern, farther north in Europe, like in the Caucasus Mountains, like in places like where, uh, you know, Bulgaria is today, places that do have pretty serious winters. So this is an ancient migration that happened in prehistoric times, but the Greek people know it in their mythology, and a lot of these stories of winter and summer might come from living in a different climate, and they move to the Mediterranean later on. So just some of the things that you got to think about when you think about mythology, you got to compare it to the context and the history and, and the geography and even the climate of the place where people lived to help you understand these stories. Now, we're about an hour into our program, folks, and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to stretch, stand up, circulate your blood. I'm going to do the same. But this is also, I'll get, give you a couple of minutes of a break, but I really want you to think of a good question that you'd like to ask. Maybe it's a, about Persephone or Virgo. Maybe it's about Leo or anything else. So just stretch and hopefully come up with a good question that you would like to ask. Stretch, guys. Do some stretches. Do some jumping jacks. Look, see? Look at him. See, he's stretching. Look like an Egyptian. <laughs> Stretch. <laughs> Up high, arms over the head. That's what I'm doing. Your arms are over here. It's really good to get the blood flowing. Look at him. See? You've got to get going. Just because he it, can't see. You can fall stretch. asleep. If I sit in a chair for too long, I fall asleep. Stretch. Up. If I designed movie theaters, they would have bicycles and treadmills. <laughs> Will I fall asleep? <laughs> Did you fall asleep over? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <I> heard you. <laughs> so you really got to get it, get it, get on the stairmaster now. Yeah. See, that's the thing. I'm telling stories about the stars. Your brain is. Yeah, so we walk up the stairs. Yeah, go for it. Run up the stairs really quick. We'll run up. a couple minutes, but I really would love to hear some great questions. So you run up the stairs and think of a question. Mm -hmm. Drink some water. Did I ever heard I was running around the table with me. <laughs> oh, that's right. That was last week. Mm -hmm. oh. Give your parents hugs. Thank, thank them for being such great parents. That's another way to stretch your arms. That sounds good. Hello. I'm waiting. Yeah. I always forget that I can do this in the planetarium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just as a funny side note, this app that runs the lights in our planetarium, when I turned it on today, it said clever ways that you can use your light to help you while you're stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> Even this app is now telling us what to do during our time stuck at home. Mm -hmm. We had a good thing that's actually what I'm following now. You can program this app to make the lights flicker on and off every hour, on the hour or whatever time you choose. So it reminds you that you should probably stand up and stretch your legs and do what I just told you to do. You can have a, a, a lighting program do that for you automatically. How many times did you run up and down the stairs? 
I ran up the stairs 19 times. Whoa, that's pretty good. You probably have a lot of oxygen in your brain now. Yeah. So I'll give you another minute and then we'll get started with the game. But I hope, I'm really, really hoping we have some great questions. We can talk about other subjects, guys, because of the fact that astronomy is such a far-ranging thing. We can, you can ask me questions about things outside of the constellations that we've been talking about. You could ask them about and, I, and also, I should mention, I know you probably at this point feel like you've heard enough for your entire lifetime about COVID-19. But I am also ready to explain any of the questions that you might have about that, should you choose. I think you guys probably would rather have a break from that than to have me talk about that. So willing and able to talk about that if you're curious about all the stuff that's going on in the outside world. Well, here, let me, let me, let me entertain you with a, an interesting story about cultures and different ideas about gods and goddesses and saints and, and the worship. If you guys are familiar with the country of Cuba, where my mother comes from, Cuba has a really interesting combination of religion because most Cubans are Catholic, uh, and that comes from the influence of uh, influence Spanish culture on Cuba, but a lot of Cubans also practice a religion that has many gods and goddesses, similar to the religion of the ancient Greeks, but it's a religion that comes from West Africa, from the culture of the Yoruba people that live in today, Nigeria. In fact, Nigeria's great largest ethnic group is the Yoruba people today, and a lot of Yoruba people were brought to Cuba as slaves, and it, at one point during the time of slavery, they came in such great numbers that instead of having to lose their culture and their language, the Yoruba people were able to preserve it almost completely in a completely different country. But during the time of slavery, the Spanish priests and the Spanish uh, slave masters did not allow the slaves to practice a religion that was so obviously African. So the Yoruba people wanted to worship their gods and goddesses without getting in trouble with the authority. So they decided to assign a Catholic saint, which was approved by the priests and the, and, the, and the powers that be, and they assigned a Catholic saint to each one of the gods and goddesses of their pantheon, who they called Orishas. And the reason why I'm telling you about this is because there's a, there's a saint called Lazarus. Saint Lazarus in Christian uh, theology is a saint that was covered in wounds. He, he was a leper, and he's followed by dogs, and he's always shown walking on crutches. And that's part of the story of St. Lazarus, is how, he, how he, his malady affected his body. But in the Yoruba culture, they have a god that is the god of sickness and health. And his name sounds a little bit like my name. It's not Bobby, but it's Babalu Aye. Believe it or not, you would have heard Ricky Ricardo singing that in I Love Lucy. Babalu. <laughs> For those of you old enough to know that show. So, Babalu Aye is a god of sickness and health. And if you look at Yoruba depictions of him, he's shown as a leper wearing the rags that lepers wore to protect themselves. So, he's the, goddess of, he's the god of sickness and health, and he looks like a very sick person. So, can you imagine how the Yoruba people saw these Catholic saint statues of St. Lazarus walking on crutches? covered in lesions, and they said, hmm, that guy looks like their version of our guy, Baba Luaye. And so we won't get in trouble if we worship Baba Luaye with this statue, because they'll think it's just St. Lazarus. So that is how that happened. And if you go to where I grew up, you'll see people having statues of St. Lazarus, eight feet tall, surrounded inside of a glass shrine with purple neon lights lighting it up. They'll have a god on their lawn. And it looks like a Catholic saint, but the worship of that Catholic saint is actually partially the worship of an African deity called Baba Luaye. So how crazy is that? When we talk about these gods and goddesses, we think of them as religions from the past, but you have to remember that there are still people today who 
believe in religions that have multiple gods and goddesses, most famously the Hindu culture, in which there are, I think, more than a million gods. And I'm going to list them for you right now. No, just kidding. So. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so I hope everybody stretched their brain. I hope everybody got some water in their bellies or some food, and you're ready to continue. So Persephone, I think we've got the point of this constellation. It is a very seasonal constellation, and now is the season when we can see her. So because of the fact that she's so important, there's other things in the sky that get left out. And let me teach you one of my favorite little constellations that you can look for anytime you're looking for Virgo. This is a little funny for me to mention because its name is a little uh, weird in today's world. A constellation that is supposed to resemble a crow, and it's called Corvus. Not coronavirus. But Corvus, does anybody know what that means? You heard of the word in Spanish, cuervo? In science, a corvid is a, animal, a bird in the family of the crows and ravens and blue jays. They're all called corvids. And that comes from this ancient Latin word for a crow, corvus. So this is a constellation of a little crow, and it's right below where Persephone or Virgo is. So it's easy to find. And I'll tell you why. Even though it's small, it's a very distinctive shaped constellation. Can you see it? How it really does look like, uh, it looks like a trapezoid. But it's easy to make that picture into a crow or something else. Once you learn Corvus, you can use Corvus as a shortcut to finding where Virgo is. Corvus is small and distinctively shaped, whereas Virgo is big and sprawling and spread out. So if you forget where she is, look for little Corvus down below her, and then you'll be able to find her and Spica very easily. So for me, Corvus has always been sort of a navigational aid, sort of a, a landmark or a star mark to help me find my way to Persephone and Virgo. So, okay. Let me, let me address the constellation with the funny name that everybody wants to call booties. I wonder if anybody even knows how to pronounce that correctly. It's not booty. <laughs> now, when you see this written originally, this first O has an umlaut. You know what the umlaut is? It's the little two dots over a, a vowel. And that tells you that you're supposed to say that vowel with the hard sound. So it's actually bo-otis. Bo-otis. And this is a constellation that is supposed to be a herder. In fact, Bootis that means an ox herder. But when I look at this constellation, I honestly just see an ice cream cone, okay? So let me show you how I see it. That's probably better to see than an ox herder. But this star is one of the brightest stars in the entire sky, Arcturus. And Arcturus, if I'm not mistaken, it might be like number three. Remember, Sirius is number one. But Arcturus is super bright. And the name Arcturus gives you a hint as to how to find it. This goes back to what we talked about last time. Do you remember the Big Dipper or Ursa Major? Hold on, let me get that highlight off of Arcturus. Let me zoom out a bit of the sky. See the Big Dipper? Remember the tail of the bear? Well, check out the illustration they have for Bodhi, by the way. I don't know how that matches up with the stars at all. <laughs> and I don't know what he's doing with that thing. I better keep that away from the bear. But when I look at this, check this out. See the Big Dipper, how the handle arcs? This is an old trick that astronomers have been using for centuries. This handle arcs towards Arcturus. So the arc of the handle of the Big Dipper points you right towards the brightest star in Bootis. And if you want to see it the way I see it as an ice cream cone, then pretend that that's the bottom of the cone and here is the waffle cone right here. Um, and here is the ice cream scoop. Can you see that? Yum. Yeah. Ice cream. Mm. 
also goes with the time of Persephone, summer. So think about that. That's another thing that also appears in the sky. The ancients didn't think of it as ice cream, but I like to call it that. I'm not the only one. That's a commonly known nickname for this the ice cream cone. That's how a lot of astronomers teach this constellation to people. But it's kind of cool because it appears during the time in the spring when you probably start thinking about having ice cream outside. So follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle to Arcturus, and you're looking at one of the brightest stars in the sky, and then you're free to make up whatever picture you want to see in the constellation Boötes. But now I want to sort of sneak ahead a little bit to a later time of the year. Now I could just advance time, but I want to show you something else. I'm going to take that ecliptic line out of the sky. I want to know. I want to show you something that you know you might not notice from one night to the next. But I'm going to jump exactly one day at a time. And I want you to pick a star that's close to the horizon. Maybe like one of these, like, the, oh, that's here. Oh, yed posterior. Oh, sorry, that's Ophiuchus's butt. I apologize. But that star right there, I'm gonna jump a day in the future and I want to see if anybody can observe something happening. I'm gonna put the date down here. This is, look at the time, it's 11.15 on tonight, and I'm gonna jump to tomorrow night. You notice something? Let's jump to another night. And another night. Uh oh, oh, that pesky moon. The pesky moon is moving in the opposite direction of everything else. Look, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, and look. Now we have a, a, a moon that's waning, and if we keep going into the 11th, no moon at all. Look how dark the sky is now. 12, 13, 14. What's happening to the sky? Am I changing the time? It's still 11, 15. Does anybody see what's going on here? That pair of stars, the yed posterior that I had you look at, look at where it is now at 11.15. Where's it gonna be in May at 11.15? Whoa, and in June, whoa. Do you see what's happening here? Every night, the stars that were rising are a little ahead of where they were the night before. They're a little advanced, which is exactly why when Persephone's rising in the east during the spring. Six months later in the fall, she's going to be heading down in the west even at the same exact time in the evening. That's because the sky is shifting by a, a, an amount that's roughly four minutes per day. Maybe I'm going to leave that for you guys as a kind of a lingering question, sort of a homework assignment for you to try to figure out the answer to until next week. I'm not gonna tell you the answer, but I wanna know who can figure out what is going on. Why do the stars that we see rise roughly four minutes earlier every night? So if that star was visible at, at eight o'clock tonight, it'll be visible at 7.56 tomorrow night, and the next night it'll be visible at 7.52. And if you add up all those four minute increments, eventually, well, let you figure that out. What's going on? What's causing this weird change? Like, how come we don't see Virgo every night? Why can't we see Virgo in the winter? Why not? We see the Big Dipper in the winter, but not Virgo. So I want you to make that a serious assignment. This could be something that you could figure out just with your brain, or maybe you need to get pencil and paper, or you might need to do research. But I think if you go jump on Wikipedia and look for the answer that way, that'll be a lot less fun than if you try to figure it out on your own. I think I know. Oh, B, you made it too easy. Okay, what do you think, B? Um, because of the way that the Earth tilt. Mm. Is that wrong? I'm not going to say you're wrong, but the Earth tilting has more to do with the seasonal change as far as the height of the sun but it doesn't fully explain what I'm talking about, although it is connected to that. But you're on the right track. 
You think you're, 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 I think the model that you're making in your imagination is going to help you with this. But this is something that's not easy. In fact, just to be completely honest with all of you guys, I did not know what I'm asking you to figure out until I was a freshman in college. So to be completely fair, none of you should be expected to know this at your age, but I have high expectations for you guys. I think you kids could figure this out. So just think about that. Four minutes. That's the big clue. That's the only big clue I'm going to give you. But four minutes every night in shift. So with that in mind, what I'm trying to show you is that now we're in June. And now there are different things in the sky than before. There's Yed posterior, the random star I picked. But if we look for Virgo, we'll see her. Look at Leo. Instead of being rising in the east, by June, you're going to see Leo setting. And then by July, who knows? Persephone too is following, and then in August and September, you see what's going on? So, things shift quite a bit. I accidentally zoomed in. Sorry, guys. But, I want to talk about a constellation that's going to be a highlight of our summer skies. But I'm not going to tell you what it is at first. I'm going to show it to you in a way that will hopefully help you imagine it yourself. First, some of you may already know this. What is that red dot in the sky? Any guesses? Nobody? Red? Bright light in the sky that's red? Boys. Okay, not a bad guess. But let me tell you that this star is called Antares. And do you know what that means in Greek? Cover up the ant part. This star's name, Antares, literally means not Mars. It seems like the Greeks are having fun with us. But that's because this star looks like the redness of planet Mars, and it's actually in the zodiac. So it actually occupies a part of the sky that Mars could occasionally visit. Oh, I keep hitting the color thing. So look, see how that is close to the zodiac line? That's the planet's path. So if you were an ancient uh, stargazer and you saw this red dot close to that place where you know the moon and the planets go, you would be right to think that must be Mars. But you'd be wrong because it's definitely not Mars. <laughs> Does anybody know what constellation that star belongs to? It's okay. This is part of the fun. So let me show you what will happen if you stay up late and watch not Mars rising. I'm going to go through time throughout the night. Is that Orion's sword, Bobby? Oh! Oh, well, Orion, if we want to find Orion now, we'd have to look through the Earth itself. Uh, He's on the opposite side of the sky from this. So I'll give you a hint. You'll never see Orion and this constellation on the same night at the same time. Scorpion. Scorpion. Ah. Scorpion. There we go. Very good. Do you remember the story about Orion hating that scorpion? Okay. Yes. So, by the way, that dude that you see next to the scorpion is Ophiuchus. That's the Roman name for Asclepius, the ancient doctor that took a snake and turned its venom into a medicine to cure disease. And have you ever wondered why ambulances have that little stick with the snake wrapped around it as a symbol of medicine? It's after that guy, the ancient doctor from mythology. Just so you know, I have to address that because that's what Ophiuchus refer to, Ophiuchus. The constellation that's the most fun to say. But the scorpion, okay. The scorpion to the ancient Greeks was the monster that fought Orion. And they both died. They both lost. They both won, depending on how you see the story. 
But the ancient Egyptians also saw this as a scorpion too, which makes sense because in Egypt, there are scorpions everywhere. So it kind of makes sense that they ha would have had the concept of the scorpion. And let me show you how I like to see it as a scorpion. See Antares? Pretend that's the heart of the scorpion. Here is the right claw of the scorpion. And here is the left claw. So you see how they're both reaching towards the center? It actually looks like a real scorpion's claws. And there's the small head of the scorpion, his red heart, not Mars. And here's his armor-plated back. And what's that on the end of that hook-shaped tail? Yeah, see that venomous stinger right there? So that constellation is easy to see. And then if you want to have some imagination, you can add these stars as the legs of the scorpion. And then you get a really convincing picture of a scorpion. And here's one of my favorite nerdy little mnemonics that's going to help you remember how to see this. What letter of the alphabet does the scorpion resemble? <laughs> S. And guess what time of year you see the scorpion? In the spring? in the summer, and even in September. Guess which direction? South. Okay, so do you see what I'm saying? If you can't find the scorpion after all those clues, I can't help you anymore. <laughs> that's, that's all I can do for you. Spring, summer, September, south, scorpion. It's all S's, easy to remember. But that scorpion story is only based on the cultures of the Mediterranean, like the Egyptians, the Greeks and the Romans. I wonder if any of you have heard a different story from me before. Have any of you heard me talk about this constellation with another name? Not one from a, a far away culture that lives on the other side of the world, but from the culture that's lived right here in Vermont since humans have ever lived here. Nobody knows? Hmm. Hmm. Hold on a second. I accidentally highlighted that star. So, are scorpions native to Vermont? No. 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 So, it would not have made any sense for the native people of Vermont to call that group of stars a scorpion because the native people of Vermont did not see scorpions in Vermont until Discovery Channel was put on cable. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Scorpions don't live here. They're not part of this ecosystem. And the first people to live in Vermont, if you haven't guessed, I'm talking about the Abenaki people, the Native American culture, the American Indian nation who have lived here as long, as far as our archeologists can tell for 12,000 years, which by the way, is three times older than the pyramids. So if you think of ancient civilizations, the pyramids are one third the age of the culture in Vermont. How cool is that? But for the first Vermonters, for the Abenaki people, seeing a scorpion in the stars did not make sense, but they did see something else that is a famous legendary creature in Vermont. Can anybody else guess what I'm talking about? Do you see something else that you can make with the same stars as the scorpion constellation? Maybe. <laughs> Those okay, hey, you can guess. I don't care if you get it right or wrong. There's not a test. I just wonder if you can make a picture in your mind. Well, I'll tell you what the Abenaki folks call this. Oh, who said it? Oh, that's, Camp? that's two. Leela, you, you, you gave away the punchline. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, Leela's not wrong. She's completely right. She's heard me tell this story probably too many times for her own good. But. In the Abenaki culture, these stars are called Gitaskog. Gitas means horns, and skog is the Abenaki word for a snake. So basically, the horned snake, the snake with horns. Who does that sound like? Sounds like a weird monster, right? Yeah, And Gitaskog, the the horned snake monster lives in a particular part of Vermont. And now here's why I put up the ground. You see how the trees are here? Where am I? 
in most of Vermont, you cannot see the tail because of our mountains, our hills. But there's one place in Vermont where you can go and there's nothing in that direction to block your view. You could climb on a tall mountain, but that's hard. The other way to do that is to get in a boat and go on Lake Champlain. Yeah, exactly. You go in the middle of Lake Champlain. So here's why I love this story. It's not just a constellation that you have to wait for a certain season to see. It's kind of like a constellation that you had to go to a special place to see it. And because of the strange geography of Vermont, where we have so many hills and mountains blocking the view, you probably, wherever you live, you might just see his head and his horns. I mean, I can even play around with this. In, in Stellarium, if you haven't already played with it, you can make different landscapes. And if I make a more mountainous landscape, look at that. That's like my house. Oh my I have a big hill in that direction. So when I see Gitarkog, I see his head. And I see his horns. But I don't see the rest of his body. But can you see how that looks like the head and the horns? Okay. Let's take the right claw of the scorpion and remove it from the scorpion and turn it into the head of Gitasko. Here's his nose, here's his eye, and here's the top of his head. And here are the horns. That's how I imagine them. And then there's the neck of the monster. And what would this red star that's not Mars be a good part for this creature? It's red, right below his neck. Heart. That's the heart of the lake monster. <laughs> it's the heart of the scorpion too. So if you could see this from your house, then you would say, oh, I know that there's more to this picture. But if I want to see the whole thing, I've got to take a boat out into the middle of Lake Champlain. And then if you would see the head and the horns and the neck and the red heart and the little body right here. Oh, look, you've got little flippers for swimming. and the curled up tail. So I like this one because I think it really looks like a scorpion and it really looks like the lake monster at the same time in my imagination. But I, it's the only constellation that I've ever heard of in any culture so far, and I don't know them all, but it's the only one that I know of that is actually geographically located. So you have to really go to a specific place to see it. And that's just because of the, the way our state is and our geography. If you lived in Florida, there's no mountains and the scorpion would be higher in the sky. So you wouldn't have to go anywhere special to see it. You would see it just from your backyard. But if you live in Vermont and you wanna see the lake monster, you had to go to a special place. And I think that that makes the constellation even cooler to me. That makes it even more special. However, now that we know where the scorpion is, or Gitas go the lake monster. This, remember, is visible the spring, summer, and September. So you can start seeing it now, but you probably have to stay up way past your bedtime, and I don't want to get in trouble with your folks. So just wait until the summertime, once the you know the nights are warm, and you can go out and look at Scorpius or Gitas go anytime you want. And remember that this too is a member of the zodiac. And that's going to also lead me to the next constellation. Does anybody know who's next to the scorpion? It's right here. Does anybody recognize something in these stars? Nobody. Okay. Let me show you how I see it. Here is a handle. Here is a scout. Tip me over and pour me out. A teapot. Yes. That's not an official constellation, but that's what everybody that I know that likes to look at the stars looks for when they want to find the constellation better known as Sagittarius. Now, in Greek, sagita means arrow. So Sagittarius means the archer. But when you see a picture of Sagittarius, what do you usually see? A 
So, any of you folks Percy Jackson fans? Yes. Yes. You might know who this is. Chiron. Exactly. Chiron the Centaur, which is a character in the Percy Jackson stories because, of course, he's the character in Greek mythology, is actually the centaur that makes Sagittarius. So it's not just any archer, it's the trainer of heroes, Chiron. So, Camp Demigod, anyone? Well, anyway. So, Chiron. Now, here's the thing. It's another one of these disappointing things. I don't want to destroy all your constellation dreams. But do you really think you can see Chiron in those stars? Let me take all these distracting no. things out of the way. By the way, just a note, just a note, Corona Australis, not coronavirus. Corona Australis means the southern crown. And that's that little laurel that you see there. But you can see that that too is a very paltry constellation made up of very faint stars. And do you see that archer centaur Chiron? Nah. What is easy to see is a teapot instead. But can you see how the teapot looks like a bow and arrow? There's the arrow. There's the bow. So I'm pretty sure the reason why they started calling this the archer is because it looked like a little bow and arrow. Oops. But really, that's pretty pathetic. I mean, my kids' Nerf toys look scarier than that bow and arrow right there. I'll tell you that. So, Teapot Sagittarius. Want to know my silly trick for remembering this? Check this out. If we zoom out from where we're looking, what is also going where the scorpion's tail and the teapot are? Does anybody recognize that? The Milky Way. The Milky Way. Do you see how bright it is and how dark it is? In fact, Sagittarius, now this is outside of ancient mythology, Sagittarius is actually in the direction of the center of our Milky Way galaxy. That is the big center of it all in our galaxy. So think of the teapot spout as opening up into something else. Right near the spout opening is where astronomers discovered the first black hole. And now we realize it's the ma supermassive black hole that's at the center of our galaxy. It's sort of like a big glob of gravity glue holding all of the rest of these stars in place. And that, uh, that black hole's name is, call is, is called Sag A star. It's written as S-A-G for Sagittarius, A asterisk. And the asterisk, astronomers call it star. So they called it Sag A star because they didn't know what it was. They found a source of radio waves in that direction. And over the course of decades, they discovered that what they were looking at is now known to be a supermassive black hole that's holding our galaxy together. So when you look at the teapot, you're looking toward the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And you're, here's another way to remember this teapot. You see all that dark uh, stuff from the Milky Way? Pretend that it's steam coming out of the teapot spout. And pretend that the teapot is being poured onto the tail of the scorpion that snuck into your kitchen. I know all these ideas might sound silly and hokey to you, but these are the tricks that astronomers use to remember all this detailed information. It's really hard to remember all the constellations, but a teapot pouring water onto the scorpion's tail, that's actually an easy thing to remember. That's like a Looney Tunes idea. So if you remember that concept, then you always know where the scorpion and the teapot or Sagittarius are relative to each other. And I'm going to put the ground back into the picture. Oh, I put us on a, a mountain with lots of trees. Let me pick a place with a little bit flatter horizon, less of a blocking view. This is what you can expect to see if you live in a, you know, in a really flat part of Vermont, the scorpion and the teapot. And this is what it'll look like in the middle of a summer night. But look at how low they are on the horizon. Does anybody want to guess as to what time of year the sun is going to be in front of the teapot and the scorpion? Maybe if I put up the ecliptic line. I continue line. to get these. Oh, what was that? Sorry, that's me having technical difficulties over <laughs> here. I, I can see. I'm very eager to answer. I was excited. I can see your face, but I can't see anything you're doing. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. It's not you. I think it's our something here. 
Okay, I'm backing up the view big time so we can see far away. Oh no, it's 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 us. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we'll hear you. Well, what I was trying to show folks, I'll try to describe it in words too, is that the line of the ecliptic, by the way, what do you guys think these two pearls on the string are? That's Jupiter and that's Saturn. Zeus and Kronos, Luke and Vader. Just kidding. But anyway, that's going to be in the sky this summer, by the way. This summer, we're going to be treated to seeing Jupiter and Saturn close by. It's going to be a great time to do some stargazing. I hope by the summer, we will be able to do it in person and not digitally, but something to look forward to seeing. But do you see how low this is on the horizon? Remember, the zodiac is the path of the sun and the moon also, besides the planets. When, oh, when... Will the sun be this low above the horizon? Come on. Nobody? I'm going to put up a little line to help you as a guide. There's the meridian. That's the line where the sun is at noon. Look at how low that is. It's practically barely scraping the ground. What time of year does the sun never get high in the sky? Winter. winter. Ah, that is exactly the time when the sun is in front of these two. So you see them in the summer because the sun is on the opposite side of the sky. And in the winter, the sun is in the same direction. So you can't see Scorpius and Sagittarius during the winter because they're literally out during the daytime. And at night, they're below the horizon. So just think about it this way. The teapot, the, the, the teapot here this is, represents when the sun hits New Year's, right, uh, right at the top of the teapot. So think about this as being where the sun is at the beginning of the year. And at the end of the year, in December, the sun passes through the scorpion's claws over its tail and reaches the teapot for January 1st. So this represents the lowest point that the sun occupies throughout the year. Remember how Scorpion or Gita's Gog is low on the horizon? Same thing with the sun. So when the sun is there, we get weak light and it gets cold because our days are short. The sun spends a very small amount of time in the sky compared to in the summer. And maybe this is, uh, try to wrap things up and get back to where we started. You're not going to see Scorpio easily if you get out tonight, but let me put the sky up. Let me put tonight's sky back up and put that same line. Guess which constellation is where the sun is at its highest? So on the summer solstice, the sun is in the Gemini constellation and it's high in the sky, as high as it can be. In the winter solstice, the sun is in the scorpion's tail near the teapot, and that's the lowest the sun can be. So if you know these constellations, Gemini and Scorpius and Sagittarius, you have in your mind figured out the high and the low for the sun throughout the year. And if you go to different parts of the world, you'll see that that changes depending on where you live. If you lived in Florida, T Gemini and Scorpius are both kind of high in the sky because the sun is never low in the sky when you go that far south. But if you go to Vermont, you'll have one high, one low. And if you go north of Vermont, like into the Arctic Circle, you'll have some that you'll never see from that. You if you go to the North Pole, you never can see the Scorpion. So what happens during at the North Pole when the sun is in front of the Scorpion? If you can't see the Scorpion and the sun is in the same direction as the Scorpion, what happens to the light of the sun in the North Pole? It goes bye-bye. Yeah. So all of these things sound really weird and a lot of complicated things, but I want you to think about it globally, too. I want you to imagine how the view shifts from one place to another. That's something that is really easy to do in the planetarium. It's a little bit harder for you to do using Stellarium. But I want to remind you that if you get Stellarium, 
one of the things that you can do besides uh, putting up the pictures of the constellations and all that and the names, all that, you can put up those lines that I showed you, like the meridian, which cut the sky in half, or the ecliptic, which is the path of the planets and the sun and the moon. But the other cool thing is that you can take yourself to any location in the world. If you hit the location window, you'll see a list of places in the world, a huge list. And if you don't like the places that are listed there, you can type in your own or punch in your own latitude and longitude. And maybe this could maybe help you figure out the big question that I wanted to ask you, which is why do the stars rise four minutes earlier every night? Maybe you should see if that would be the same in other locations. Maybe watching the day and the night unfold from a different part of the world maybe we'll give you some insight into this i don't know but you could try it out because if you've ever wondered what the sky looks like from australia well are you got oh wait what happened oh well it's daytime when we're in but if i fast forward through the day oops, and make it nighttime i will be seeing all kinds of stuff that i'm not used to seeing and everything is in the wrong place like look at the lion the lion is it, you know, in the Northwest and Virgo looks like she's going to get a concussion. And there's all these other things over here that we haven't seen constellations that you don't see from this latitude. So in the next week, what I would like for you to see, to try to do, and this is, I, I, I'm really making this, I, I wouldn't say homework, but this could be a lot of fun. I want all of you to play around with Stellarium as much as you can. Try to get it to do things that I haven't shown you how to do. Maybe you can use it to tell a story, like uh, find a constellation that's visible from South America or from New Zealand or from South Africa, something that we can't see from here. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do, but I want you to try to find a cool trick that you can do with Stellarium. So explore the software. Break it. Mess with it. You can't hurt this thing. You can always download it again. Uh, if you if anything goes wrong, but the point is there's so many features in here. If you mess around with it, you can actually see that you can change the culture of the star lore, for example, and that's just one of the possibilities. So I want you to find something that you can show us in Stellarium, and maybe next week some of you can show off a cool thing you discovered. It might be a way to track a planet. It could be a constellation that I haven't heard about that you're curious about. I want you to try to find something in Stellarium that's new, find a way to use it, play with it. Pretend you're a Starship captain, and this is your navigational computer, and you need to figure out how it works. Otherwise, we're going to be lost adrift in space. We only have a few minutes left, guys, about nine minutes before we're going to wrap things up. I'm hoping that we have some good questions. You know, there's so many other constellation stories I could tell you. Maybe what you guys should do now is talk, tell me what are you curious in hearing. If you don't have any questions to ask, you can at least tell me what subject in the sky you're most fascinated by or what you hope that I will cover in one of our future classes. Um, I was wondering about the crown in the sky. What does that represent? Ah, the one that was close to Boötes? Yes. Ah, I did not mention it. I'm so glad you brought it up. That is called Corona Borealis. Now, well, let me go, let me fix all this stuff. I messed everything up. I'm just gonna, actually, I'm gonna quit Stellarium because sometimes, just so you know, if you get totally out of whack, the easiest thing to do is just to quit the program and restart it. And whenever you reload it, it'll reload to whatever the default settings were. So I'm gonna show that to you now as I'm reloading Stellarium. Oops. Hit the wrong button. There we go. Oh, hold on a second, guys. Okay, now can everybody see Stellarium again? Yes. Set to tonight. So let me fast forward time, bring about the sunset. So over there in the east, close to Arcturus, you meant the one that was close to him over here? 
Is this the one you're talking about, B? I think so. Well, this is actually a really easy thing to see. Arcturus, remember the ice cream cone? Okay, right below the ice cream cone is Corona Borealis. That just means northern crown. Remember Corona Australis? Australia, Australis means southern. Borealis, like boreal forest. Aurora Borealis, the northern lights. Corona Borealis just means northern crown. And its brightest star is called Gemma. And that's because it's like the tiara that Miss America wears, you know? It's got a bright diamond right in the middle of it. It's actually like a diadem, like Rowena Ravenclaw wore once upon a time. I'm showing off my Harry Potter nerdiness, I know. <laughs> but, so, see how it looks like that? Like a diadem, like a tiara, like a crown? It's not a very amazing constellation, but it's really easy to spot. It's really easy to find. And maybe this will be a good way for me to wrap things up. Um, remember the big bear? Well, Ursa Major? Well, in the Abenaki stories, there's a great coincidence about how the Abenaki folks see a bear, but they don't see a long tail. In the Abenaki stories, these three stars are actually one, two, three hunters that are always chasing this bear. And in that, that version of the story that comes from the Abenaki folks, they see the Northern Crown as the den that the bear was hibernating in. So can you see that? It looked like a little hole in the ground that he came out of. And then the three hunters started chasing him. So we'll do a little bit more of that kind of storytelling on another time. But I wanted you to know that sometimes cultures that live very far apart from each other see the same picture in the stars. It's not the only case with Ur Ursa Major, the big bear for the Greeks and the Romans, and Kitsio Wassos, which is the Abenaki name for the gray bear that lives in the sky. Isn't that cool? I mean, a culture from North America and a culture from the Mediterranean, they never got to talk to each other, but in their ancient traditions, they ended up seeing the same creature in the same stars, except for the fact that in the Greek and Roman stories, it's a long-tailed bear, which I talked about last time. And in the Abenaki stories, it's one, two, three hunters that chase this bear through the sky. So maybe as a last thing, I'll give you a little special treat. Remember how the Big Dipper can save your life by pointing out the North Star? Well, you remember this part of the Big Dipper? This star? The second hunter in the Abenaki stories? Or the middle of the handle of the Big Dipper? Or the middle of the tail of the Big Bear? That's a star that actually is two stars closely linked. And if I zoom in on Stellarium, which is something that you can also figure out how to do, you can see these two stars. They're known by their Arabic names, Mizar and Alcor. But you have to have pretty much 20-20 vision or close to it to be able to see both of them in the sky together. When you look at them with your naked eye, they're so close together that they look like one dot, kind of like that. So this is visible every night of the year. This is a free eye exam built in to the Big Dipper, thanks to the Abenaki Nation. And the Abenaki folks weren't the only folks to know about this little tricky eye test. According to legend, Genghis Khan, the Mongolian conqueror, used that as an eye exam for his archers in their cavalry, his Sagittarian centaur warriors that would conquer so much of the world. They had to have their eyes tested with these stars. So use the Big Dipper to find the North Star, Polaris. Use the Big Dipper to test your vision with Mizar and Alcor. And I think I'll leave it at that. But I hope that you take advantage of trying to answer that question as to why the stars rise four minutes earlier every night before. And then try to use the Stellarium to do something that you haven't seen me do in here yet. Maybe you can discover a new way to use this amazing program because it's free for everyone to download. So tell your friends and you can use it you know, to have a maybe a virtual star party with your friends. You can show them constellations too. If everybody downloads Stellarium, you can, you know, do a new social thing 
<laughs> and talk to your friends online and see if you can have a start party with them and teach them some of the things that I've taught you today. So. Well, thank you, Bobby, so much. This is an amazing amount of information and um, just capabilities of yours using Stellarium. Uh, hopefully, like you said, everyone will get a chance to use it um, on their own. And I uh, want to thank the group for, for joining us tonight and anyone who joined us on YouTube. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll have more classes tomorrow um, starting at 9 5, a walk with the planets. Uh, for grades um, seven and eight. But um, thank you again, Bobby. That was a huge effort and we really appreciate it. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and sign off on the YouTube. If you guys have any other questions, you can ask really quickly, but otherwise we're gonna end um, this uh, meeting. <laughs> well, I just wanna say one more thing because everybody's, everybody's in the same boat right now. But I wanna quote my friend April, who earlier today said that we should spend as much green time as we spend on screen time. So I know this has been two hours of screen time, but guess what? The sun hasn't set yet. It's still nice out. Run outside and see if any flowers are blooming. Try to get some fresh air, stretch your legs. Instead of running up and down the stairs, run up and down the road. Just because we have to stay away from each other doesn't mean you have to stay indoors. Please go outside, get fresh air, see the wonders of spring. And you yeah, haven't see the stars too. But thank you all, and I hope you're all well. And I can't wait to the day that we can all meet again in person. But until that time, keep looking up. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 We miss you guys.